everyone. We're Marin and Angela, and this is Homeschool Unrefined. We created this podcast to change the conversation about homeschool. This is a place where we encourage each other to do less, be ourselves, embrace natural learning, and keep homeschool simple, real, and fun. We are longtime friends, Minnesotans, and practiced homeschool parents with our master's degree in education. We are an inclusive and non-sectarian podcast and community. We believe Black Lives Matter and affirm LGBTQ plus families. We hope this is a place where we can all learn and grow together. This is episode 172, How We Homeschool with Rachel Jepson Wolf. And we are going to get to that uh, conversation in just a minute. First, Maren, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm great. Good. Uh, I think you're up for our aha moment this week. I am. And I wanted to bring it, bring it down a notch. Okay. Um, so we've been talking <laughs> about big changes this this season. You and I, especially with our kids, mm-hmm. changing the way we're learning in mm-hmm. major ways. But I wanted to bring it down into to something much smaller and just say, small changes can make big differences. Mm. Small changes. Um. So. <laughs> our kids yes. have some of our kids have started school this year. This is huge. I mean, that's really big. But there are so many things that are just little that can just change your whole day. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and so like I'm thinking of what what made me think of this is this last week or maybe it was 2 weeks ago. I there's I have like this little end it's almost like an end table, but it also, the top can open up and it has all of our, <laughs> you're going to laugh, dress up clothes in it. Oh, wow. Still. Dress up clothes. Mm-hmm. I know. And I was like, why am I holding on to this? I'm holding on to mm. this because of sentimental reasons. Mm-hmm. Nobody dresses up in our, <laughs> in our house anymore. Nobody plays dress up. I shouldn't say that. Actually, I have kids who, older kids now, and they kind of dress up in like, real life now yeah you know right. what i mean like their totally. clothes that they wear into the yes. real world is their yes. dress up For sure. and so um putting on a cape or a like a doctor's outfit that doesn't <laughs> they don't do that anymore <laughs> and so i cleaned that out and it's just i don't know i we are using that area that's thing for stuff we actually use like blankets now you know and it's yeah. just it's changed everything we used to have a pile of blankets <laughs> just around our couch yeah. and i was like where are we going to put these <laughs> where are we going to put these blankets <laughs> well guess what they have a home now and it's amazing <laughs> that is so awesome i'm moving on to the next season i'm accepting wow. where we're at and moving on um, That's so great yeah. because I do not have anywhere to put blankets in my living room. Yeah. So I, I know that pain. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I did get a text from you like a week ago with yeah. a picture of some dress up clothes. Yep. Saying, are these yours? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, from like six years ago. <laughs> I don't need them. <laughs> well, I was wondering because they were sentimental to you. I remember when you gave them to me and you said, I'm going to need these back. Did I? Yes. Uh, I don't anymore. And so I felt com- very guilty <laughs> when I opened that up and there they were. But then also, because I know your kids are old and have moved on and maybe at one point they were looking for them and I don't know. Oh, no. Um, and then also I thought, do you want it? Did you want to keep them as a memory? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Some things you keep as memories. But yeah, I know. But not that. No. Because they kind of, at least my kids' dress up clothes got so worn. Yes. So worn and yep. stained. And it's just like, I can't even, no. nobody else is going to want this. <laughs> no. Another thing, I'm just going to share a few other things that I've done recently. Oh, yeah. Small things that have made such a big difference. Um, last holiday season, I used to wrap presents in my bedroom. I would put stuff under the bed, like Mm. the stuff, and then pull it out and then, you know, wrap presents on my carpet or something or on the bed, a soft surface. I didn't like it. And plus, it just cluttered my bedroom. It ended up cluttering, even though I put things underneath. There were just peripheral things that wouldn't fit under the bed. And I don't know, it just, it crowded my bedroom and it just felt, I didn't, it wasn't peaceful. My bedroom was no longer a peaceful sanctuary. <laughs> it was yeah. the wrapping station. So we, I moved it down to the basement where <clears throat> we have a ping, to- ping pong table. Ooh. And I'm just using that <laughs> as yeah. the wrapping station. Good idea. And 
I'm putting stuff under the ping pong table. And you know what? If it's messy there and somebody wants to play ping pong, they can just move it. It's they fine. Move it. They care zero percent about that. They can do it. <laughs> they, it's not a big deal. They don't need it to be a sanctuary down there. <laughs> I need my bedroom to be a sanctuary. So that felt like a really good change to me. That's great. And I, <laughs> you know, we both are in birthday season. Our kids yes. have birthdays at the same time <clears throat> as the holidays. <clears throat> so, you know, it's a lot of <clears throat> gift giving going on. Um, and I just did wrap gifts for my son's birthday. Yeah. Um, and I, I, it was like four gifts and uh, just yeah. being on the floor. Mm-hmm. I, like my back is mm-hmm. aching, aching. I know. Why and are we I, doing this to ourselves? We're in our <laughs> mid forties. I can't be sitting crisscross and I'm trying to fold a present anymore. It doesn't feel good. On carpet. No, I know. On carpet. Yeah. That's so good. I yeah. love it. But the only problem for me is like. If I bring it out into the main area, I, I didn't have to do it when nobody's home because if oh, I bring yeah. it out into the main area, then people can see. I know. No, you're right. <clears throat> I gotta... I picked the basement because it's easy to tell people just don't come down to the basement. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, if it were in the area where everybody always was, yeah, that'd be a problem too. So this felt good. <laughs> That's felt great. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then other kids want to use it too. And I just don't want them like... Wrapping presents in my ba- my bedroom, too. You know, like, while I'm trying to have a peaceful time, whatever. So, for sure. They can be down there doing their own thing, too. So, yep. it just felt really good. That felt like a good change. Um, another thing, this is really little, but my teenager who, who has a computer where she plays Minecraft mostly and does other things. She, you know, follows Twitch streams and such. Um, <laughs> it was... The, the computer where her, you know, I it has to be out in a public area is what I wanted, you know. Mm. But she also wanted some privacy, too. She's like, I don't want people. What was happening was people were coming up and watching, uh, like, right behind her, what she was yeah. doing. And she's like, <laughs> oh, this is not working. And so all I did was I turned the desk around. I turned mm. the desk around. The computer is now facing the wall. So mm. I can come and check and see what's going on at any time I I want, but like not, people aren't, it's not inviting. People mm. aren't coming up to her and being like, oh, what you watching? <laughs> you know, which is what she does not want. And so it just yeah. feels like this dynamic changed in our whole house where her frustration is gone. It's completely gone. And mm, everyone amazing. else's temptation to join in what she's doing is also gone. That's amazing. I know. It's just, it was this <laughs> one little change, like the direction of a desk. Good so, job. Anyway, just little things around the house like that that are yeah, working. I love your just, aha moment. Yes. Yeah. Little things. Little things. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, well, we wanted to let everybody know that this is our last episode of the season. Uh, we are going to be back in February with our next season. But until then, you are always welcome to join us on Patreon. We do four episodes a month over there. We do two Q&Ps, mm-hmm. question and process. We do one check-in, which is more of a, like a personal update on how we're doing. And then we do one LTW extra. Right. And then also, if we ever have a guest on, we yep. always have an extra, an extended interview with that person, too. So we have at least four episodes per month, oftentimes Sometimes more. more. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so like this mo- this week, we are talking to Rachel Jepson wolf We also did a Patreon segment with her. So right mm-hmm. now... If you go to Patreon, you will see that extra episode there. Our latest Patreon episode is a Q&P where we discussed a question about neurodivergence and educational styles. Um, and another question discussing at what age to be worried that your child isn't reading yet. Yes. So, so we if have you, thoughts and feelings. We have thoughts about that. So if you, we have processing about that. We do. We, have, we do. So if you go head over to Patreon right now, you can find those that episode there. Um, and like I said, if you're missing us at all in the next couple months, yeah. that's where you can find us. Mm-hmm. And you can. Um, and you'll you can also go, get all of our back content too. So for sure, so you have, so many episodes. You have months and months of content over there. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to patreon.com slash homeschool unrefined to sign up there. It's just $5 a month. All right. In this episode, we are talking to Rachel Jepson Wolf. And we are so excited about this because she has been on our um, list since we started this podcast mm-hmm. five years ago as somebody who we wanted to talk to. And um, we just never got around to asking her until now. And so we are very, very thrilled to have her on. She is the owner and founder of Lusa Organics where you can find at lusaorganics.com, which is a body care company specializing in herbal balms, soaps, and body care. 
Mm-hmm. Rachel and her husband, Pete, homeschool their two kids in rural southwestern Wisconsin. Rachel is the author of two books, Herbal Adventures, a wild crafting book for kids and their families, and The Unplugged Family Activity Book, a treasure trove of screen-free fun. You can find her online at rachelwolfclean.com. Well, welcome, Rachel, to Homeschool Unrefined. We are so glad you're here. Thanks for asking me to join you. Yeah. Um, Could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, um, your job, your family, and all of that good stuff? Sure. Um, So I own a small business called Lusa Organics. We make organic uh, botanical skincare for babies and kids and um, palm oil-free bar soap, uh, a whole slew of different products. Uh, So we have that humming along. I do some writing. I've published a couple books. Um, My background is biology and environmental education. So I've kind of abandoned that in my main (laughs) business, but picked it up again a bit in the books I've written. Um, Yeah. And then I'm, I've homeschooled my two kids since, since straight out of the gate. Yeah. That is really. And they're teens now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, So awesome. So you've been homeschooling the whole time. Um, How did you make the decision to homeschool? Um, You know, what were the deciding factors there? And I'm wondering also, like, did you ever think about changing along the way? Yeah. So I had a friend who introduced me to loads of really life-changing paradigms. And one of those was homeschooling. When I grew up, I thought you either went to public school or prison. I think those are the only (laughs) two realities I thought existed. Um, And then I met someone who went to Catholic school. So I just sort of added that to the list of options. But, you know, I'm I'm in my late 40s and there weren't very many homeschoolers when I was growing up. I didn't know a single one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was introduced to the concept of it. I had skepticism about how it would work. I had Mm -hmm. doubts about it. I wasn't completely sold, but I was curious. Mm -hmm. And then selling my soap at events and shows and, and, you know, community gatherings, I started noticing something really noteworthy. And that was that there were these kids who had come to my booth and they engaged me in a very different way Mm -hmm. than most kids engaged me. And there was this deep eye contact. There was this curiosity. There was an aliveness that Mm -hmm. I didn't know was missing until I saw it. And the first time it happened, a child was asking me how I made soap. And I started explaining the soap making process and the chemistry, and they were just totally on fire to hear it. Wow. And mom chimed in and she said, we were just, my kids were just asking about how soap was made and we're homeschoolers. So we thought we'd make soap. And I just kind of put a pin in that in my mind subconsciously. And then it happened again Mm. and again and again. Mm-hmm. And in, you know, probably a decade of doing shows and events, I started asking these kids who just stood out to me as really alive. Mm-hmm. And I started asking, are you a homeschooler? And I was only wrong once. Wow. And that set me down this path of wanting to know what is it that these kids have experienced that has them engaging in the world in such a different way. Mm. And so that really lit a fire for me. Um, but when my son was four and my daughter was, I would, I moved right before my daughter was born to a community with a Waldorf school. And mm. so suddenly I have this newborn and I have this four-year-old becoming a five-year-old and it's time to register for kindergarten. And there's this absolutely magical school, yeah. literally a <laughs> block and a half from my house. Mm. And so it was time. We were headed out the door, literally boots on, headed to the Waldorf school to register for kindergarten. And we got halfway down the path to the sidewalk. And I turned to my husband and I was like, I want to homeschool. Ah. Like, okay, let's homeschool. And that was it. And we really honestly never looked back. Mm -hmm. And my son's 19 now. Um, So that was a literal U-turn on the sidewalk and back Mm -hmm. in. From we That was very much a crossroads for us. Wow. Wow. (laughs) That is, I don't know that I've ever heard somebody decide to homeschool for that reason, like, um, and noticing kids, noticing the other kids. And um, how they stand out to you, the homeschoolers. I, 
I don't know that I've ever heard that, but I feel like as being a reason, but I feel like a lot of us can relate to that now that we've been around homeschoolers. Yes. Totally. We see that. We see what you're talking about. Totally. Um, yes. So I just, I really love that. I, and I love how that just like planted seeds for you. Mm-hmm. Totally. And it, it shows was kind of that pro- all of us as we walk in the world, we're like, we're, you know, uh, representing homeschooling in a way with mm. our quirky curiosities right. in the world. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so beautiful. It is. It is. And then when you were walking to the Waldorf school, it's like you probably had that like seed in your head for a while, but you just didn't, you know, <laughs> say it or totally, you know, admit it to yourself or whatever. And then when it came time, you're like, oh, actually, this is so important to me. And so yeah. I think that's so great. I, it. it reminds yeah. me too, Angela, of your story when your oldest was going to kindergarten and the only, well, the only option yeah. was full day or there was this one school that had half day. <laughs> and yeah. even that was, was so much. much. It was yeah. so, so much. Yeah. Yeah. So we and did my that. Guy was, my guy was super sensitive, you know, yeah. he was a highly sensitive kid. And yes. we tried the Waldorf preschool for half days and it pretty much meant my husband went and <laughs> hung out at preschool with him <laughs> yeah. because it was like, too he was so overstimulated yep, yep. and I was like yeah we don't we don't need to do this we can do it next year or next year or the year after or exactly. after that and it just never happened yeah yeah I love that so um do you have a certain homeschool philosophy or like what kind of homeschooler are you and has that evolved through the years Hmm. It, I feel like at its very heart has never changed. Mm-hmm. So the way I parented my two-year-old, it just evolved into the way I parented my 17-year-old, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is, you know, making space for who they are and where they are and what they want to learn and experience and how they need and want to grow. So I would call myself, you know, I, I, I try not to get too hung up on language because I think if I say I'm an unschooler, then that comes with this whole package full of expectations and assumptions right. and, and all those aren't true for me. Um, mm-hmm. So, so a friend of mine referred to herself as an eclectic project based homeschooler. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> that's that's it. What we are. Um, so if, if you take a step back, yeah, we're unschoolers, mm-hmm. um, but we're unschoolers who have limited certain things and directed in certain ways. And, you know, I don't, I don't follow anybody else's checklist of what it means to be anything. And so we've found what fit for our kids and what fit for my oldest isn't necessarily mm. what fits for my youngest. Right. So my 19 year old didn't even want a cell phone until he was literally 18 years old and on the fire department and wanted to wow. be able to like text me if he wasn't coming home because he had a fire call. And so that's not your <laughs> average kid, right? Nope. So yeah. my daughter's more, my youngest is more, she doesn't have a phone yet, but there's more of an interest in those things. There's sure. more of an interest in, you know, technology than he had. Um, so we just adapt and, and figure out what works for each individual. Yep. That mm-hmm. is, that is so great. So I, I know you've run this business for a really long time throughout your whole um, parenthood. And I'm wondering if that has been an integral part of your homeschooling or if not, um, do you have any other curriculum or other things that you've really used as a way um, to teach or to um, help your kids learn through the years? So I have only used I've never used curriculum. I've mm-hmm. only bought curriculum a couple yes. of times and then just never used them. So it's, it's so good um, to hear, by the way. I just want to say that is so freeing. <laughs> it just takes away so much of the shame when I hear that from anybody. I just feel like, thank you for telling me that you bought curriculum, curriculum and never used it. Totally. It just Those feels so good. Those blocks looked so good. And then <laughs> there they were. They were Legos. They were really boring Legos. Yep. Um, so yeah, we never followed a curriculum and and my my guiding light through our whole homeschooling career has been the singular goal of raising passionate lifelong learners. So I don't need a curriculum to do that. I yeah. only need my child's passion and interest and to help them facilitate growing that. So I can give you an example and this isn't addressing your question about my business and I can circle back to that, sure. but my son got really into live action role play mm-hmm. when he was 14 years old. So live action role play for those who haven't experienced it. It's also called LARPing. Um, and it's 
basically you're putting on, you know, chain mail, you're wielding a foam sword yes. and you're go it's like if Dungeons and Dragons happened in the woods and you were in a costume running around. Yes. So, it's something I did a couple times when I was a teenager, so it was fun to see him get into it, but he got really into it. And through that, it I mean, that grew out of an interest in Norse history and mythology because mm-hmm. we're Norwegian. Mm-hmm. So then he took a deep dive into, you know, medieval history and Norse myths, and then he wanted to be a blacksmith, and so we connected him with someone for blacksmithing classes. Yeah. And then later on found a community of blacksmiths who completely took him in and mentored him. And it was fantastic. I mean, he was, That's amazing. he was younger than 14. He was, yeah. I think maybe 12 or 13 at the time. That's amazing. Um, and so now he has his own forge and he's a knife smith wow. and a blacksmith. And, wow. and so by taking this nugget of like seemingly non-cerebral interest, I want to go mm-hmm with a foam sword, chase people in the woods. And it blossomed into history and metallurgy and how many other things, social skills. Let's go, Mm -hmm. let's touch that for a second. You know, so many other aspects of life could grow out of this one interest. Um, So that's been really the heart and soul of how we've homeschooled. So as far as how that relates to my business, um, There have been times where what I do is interesting to my kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. during those ages and stages, absolutely. They, you know, we were doing foraging classes and we were making remedies together. And, and there was, it, it wove really nicely our business into our homeschooling and our family. But honestly, at, you know, as teenagers, they have less of an interest in those things. And that's completely fine with me. I don't have an attachment to them being passionate about what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. My dad's an exterminator. And (laughs) had I needed to be passionate about his passion, (laughs) I'd be a very different person. (laughs) So I want them to be authentically who they are rather than following down my right path. And so, no, they're not into it now. And that's 100% fine. (laughs) Definitely. That's awesome. I love your story about your son with the LARPing. That is <laughs> so great because I think a lot of parents might see that as like just a just an interest Dress or up. hobby. Just yeah, a hobby. Play fun. And put that into a totally different category. Right, right. Um, and not like maybe take seriously how it's growing. Yeah. Um, and not like be in tuned to Oh, now he's interested in history and, you know. Exactly. Um, and then, or, or even just that, just the role playing itself. It, like, even if it didn't go into the history yeah. or, you know, or anything, I mean, totally. that is, there's so much learning in that. Absolutely. Right. And, the and then making his costumes, you know, he was drafting patterns yeah. for, um, you know, the, the, I'm forgetting all the words because we yeah. haven't talked about it for a while, but all the like <laughs> the yeah. padding bits that go under yeah. the chain mail, like he was drafting patterns for those yep. and, you know, started doing leather working, um, made oh. chain mail. And that and then is he, amazing. he and a buddy started a LARP that they organized, marketed and facilitated weekly with local youth. And so, yeah. you know, they yep. launched this whole project that was engaging kids in our community. So it's oh. pretty cool. Amazing. That's what. That's why uh, this question about asking about curriculum is like, oh my gosh, that is such a. You know, I'm so glad that you answered um, it with what you really do because curriculum is such a tiny, tiny question compared to all of that learning that you just shared with us. I was just. It reminded me about how one of my kids who's going to school now, their teacher asked, asked me, "Where um, can I get some transcripts or like." Can you let me know what what your child has been doing for the last two years? And I was like, well, like we sold our house and we traveled for a year around the United States. And <laughs> can, do you want me to tell you about that? Or <laughs> I don't yeah. know. It's going to how long do you have? I, I can't put that. I can't put that on a transcript. Sorry. But anyway, so we like, just did transcripts for my son because he's technically graduated now yes, at 19 yes. um, and I do air quotes around graduated because truly <laughs> the way we're engaging isn't that terribly different than it was you know he's still yeah. learning and growing yeah and, um, but but we had to do transcripts for him and it was a hoot <laughs> um, yeah lots like, of how do I whittle like, this okay. down we spent five weeks in Ireland let's call that mm-hmm. geology and yeah. 
world history and everything you know, and geography I mean, it is all those things i'm not making it up like that is what we did mm-hmm. it's beyond mm-hmm. everything that they've would ever ask at school yeah. at a college even <laughs> it's like it's beyond you've done so much so that's just amazing so i know we didn't talk about this ahead of time but yeah. i am curious like do you ever have doubt that this method is the right method um do you ever feel anxious about uh oh i should have done more formal i don't know this subject um does that ever creep in for you so i think um my midwife put it really well when i was first thinking about homeschooling and talking to her about it when my son was really small and she said her kids would go off and live these amazing rich beautiful lives where they were chasing their own interests. And then she said, every once in a while, I would panic and I would pull them all in and we would do math for a week. And then I'd realize they were fine. And I'd let them (laughs) back out to do what they love to do. Mm -hmm. And so I've done it a little bit differently than she did, but, but her method speaks to it where those doubts, of course they creep up because, Mm -hmm. um, I've expressed this in some of the writing that I've done, and so this might be redundant to you, but um, for me, I I feel like we want guarantees. And if we follow the rules and things don't go according to plan, it's not your fault because Mm -hmm. you did what you were supposed to do. You did what society expected of you. Mm -hmm. But when you break the rules and something doesn't turn out, well, then it's it's your your fault. Because Mm -hmm. you didn't do what you were, quote unquote, supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's, it's such a dangerous paradigm because there are no guarantees ever. Mm -hmm. And so, sure, doubt pops up occasionally, but mostly I just see how my kids and all those kids I met at farmer's markets and shows are alive and fully in their bodies and um and curious. And that curiosity, I believe, exists in every child. And I think it just gets um, extinguished sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so no, it comes up a little, but mm-hmm. not a lot. It's not something I fret about. And maybe one reason is this, this might be relevant to people with older kids, mm-hmm. is when I started having those doubts as they got older and School has always been on the table for my kids. It's always been they've chosen to stay home. I've Mm -hmm. never said we are homeschooling. Mm -hmm. It was the choice I made, but they always knew they had other options. So Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with that. Uh, But what I did was I would ask them at the beginning of every year, where would you like to grow? What are we lacking that you, what skills do you either want to possess Mm -hmm. or want the process of learning? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want that experience of learning something new, but sometimes we just want the destination and they would write down those things and that's what we'd work on. So whether that was algebra or spelling or how to balance a checkbook, whatever it is, the things that they maybe weren't super passionate about, so they wouldn't come up as far as interest led learning goes. Mm -hmm. They came up because they wanted the destination. They wanted to know how to balance the checkbook or how to, you know, solve for X. Yeah. That is so great. That is really great. That is so great. That is, (laughs) I'm having like a little bit of an aha moment about that because I always think so much about the process. And my whole goal as a homeschool parent was to go through the process of things. We should just do the, you know, like, really enjoy the process and then to think that like (laughs) actually it's really okay to have just want to to be at the end of this goal (laughs) just let's yeah I just want to learn the skill and that's it and how do I get to be Mm -hmm. yeah and that Mm -hmm. didn't come up till they were older till they were middle school or high school age and and then it started coming up where they were seeing places that they Mm -hmm. were falling short of where they wanted to be and then if I got flack from a kid during math I would say you literally asked me to do this. <laughs> do you want to know how to solve for X or, yeah. or not? Because you asked me to do this. Yes. And then, yep. Fine. Let's do it. Um, yeah. It's so it different. The mindset. It's for so sure. different than having uh, just laying that down in front of your kid and saying, 
you're going to solve for X today. <laughs> this is yeah. Your goal. <laughs> yeah. I feel so similarly about my kids in school. And we've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, my kids chose school and I feel like their experience with school is so much different than most of their friends in school yeah. because they are choosing to be there. Totally. And if this isn't working out, you know, you have lots of other options and I'll support you. And so when it comes time to do homework or, you know, sit in a class they're not that thrilled about, they, for them, it's worth it because yeah. they want to do school in that moment. Absolutely. Yep. So it's just, it, when they are leading, you know, um, they're motivated mm-hmm. no totally. matter what they do. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. I've always said that unschooling sometimes looks like your kid going to school yeah. and that's okay too. Yeah. That's what Angela There's has not been a single saying right path to us. I, I was just yeah. saying, I, it's like, it feels like another version of self-directed learning. It is. Absolutely. It, it, it's self-directed learning just, you know, yeah, in 100%. a different way. So, yeah. Okay. So what do you see as your role as a homeschool parent of teens and young adults? You've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I just really feel like my work is to support them and to be a liaison with the world, to encourage them to get past those hangups that are hard to move through, Um, you know, complete the project. I push a little more with teens than I did with younger kids, Mm -hmm. but, but largely it's the same pattern of what I've done all along. And, and I think we have this preconceived notion in our society, at least that, Teens are hard, teens are obnoxious, teens are, you know, insert negative Mm -hmm, adjectives here. mm -hmm. And I feel like, yeah, teens need to push off of you. They need to push you away. Um, And they'll find a place to perch to do that pushing. But the less resistance we give, at least in my own experience, the less need there has been to Mm -hmm. rebel, to you know, we've had a pretty easy ride, I have to say. Um, and part of that's just because there's not a lot of resistance. We're yeah. willing to support them and who they are and the choices they're making. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> that's so great. I, I'm so glad to hear that perspective from you because you've done this all the way, like from beginning to end too. So, I mean, you're still doing it, but yeah, <laughs> it's not really ending, but yeah, it's not ending. Farther along. No, mm-hmm. yes, exactly. That's it. That was such a good point too. Um, do you have, what is your typical day now look like or week um, look like now for you with, with teens around? Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit different because it's just my daughter, my youngest um, and I who are homeschooling. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've rebuilt our rhythm to work for how she and I, um, interact and navigate our day. So right now, Lupin and I have blocked off the morning as our homeschooling time. And she has, you know, we sat down at the beginning of the year and we made the list of what she wanted to include. Um, and so that's things like algebra and spelling. We're doing some anti-racism work. We're doing history. We're doing a little bit of biology and some other things. So we have this smattering of, you know, we have this list that we're operating off of. And we get up in the morning, we get our, you know, morning chores and tasks done. And then we sit down together. And sometimes we go through most of that checklist. And some days we get through one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm comfortable punting if we're, you know, if it's not working for us, we Mm -hmm. can pivot. Yesterday, we had a little bit of a rocky morning. And so we went for a walk to the creek. And there's a new beaver dam we checked out and we just Mm -hmm. reset our day. And so there's not a preoccupation with, oh, but it's 1015. We're supposed to be doing Spanish. It's, we're just, there's more flow and flexibility. And then um, Lupin's main passion, I spoke to my son Sage's interest in LARPing and Norse history, but Lupin's a passionate artist. And so Mm -hmm. it's important to her that a chunk of time is set aside for art. And so Mm -hmm. after lunchtime, we do a little bit of housekeeping usually, sometimes. (laughs) And then after that, she has time to make art, um, in whatever that looks like. So that could be watercolor. It could be, you know, right now she's busy making a giant toadstool hat. Um, Mm. She does digital art. There's a wide variety and she just has free reign to do whatever speaks to her. And that's the second half of the day. And then I do my work during that second half of the day. That's what I was wondering. Do you go to work to do that or? 
Um, some, I often work from home. Sometimes mm-hmm. she and I go together to work mm-hmm. and then she'll work a little, do a little labeling or pick some orders and earn a little bit of pocket money, or mm-hmm. she'll do art and read books here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you live in a rural community and you have teens and COVID has happened. And so just in light of all of that, like, how are you finding community for your kids or how are they, how are they finding community in this time that we're living in? This hasn't been very fun, has it? No. (laughs) Uh, So this has been hard. I mean, honestly, it's been, it's been pretty hard. So um, my son is also a power introvert and Mm. Um, and my daughter's an extrovert and I think with COVID, neither of those is easier. Right. right? And so it was, it's been tricky. Um, honestly, we bubbled up with a couple people early on where each of my kids had somebody that they were in close Mm -hmm. contact with who Mm -hmm. was sort of following similar pre-vaccine protocol to us. Mm -hmm. And then now at this point, um, I guess throughout we made space for more digital connection, more yeah. Zoom time with friends, mm-hmm. and we set up an outside hangout space and friends would come and we'd have a campfire and we'd hang out outside whatever Good. the season. Um, awesome. And so that worked really well to make connection, but it hasn't been easy. It's been tricky. No. And and also as a homeschooling teenager, there's definitely a feeling of like the last one standing, you know, there aren't a ton of, of <laughs> homeschooling teens out there. Yeah, yeah, no. uh, and, and we fall sort of into the, onto the more liberal side of the spectrum, right. you know, we're not, we're not religious homeschoolers. We're not in yeah. the, and so it feels like there are older homeschoolers, but they're sort of in these in a different pre-established community of of like-minded families who've been hanging out together and doing co-op together forever. Sure. Whereas yeah. in our world of the secular homeschooling co-op, almost all the older kids are gone. So yeah. that is hard. Um, so we've made space to to hang out with with the kids who are still homeschooling who are older, which there are a few. I said they're all gone. They're not, but there Good. are. Good. Good. And then making time to hang out with friends who go to school after school hours. Um, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. and are those friends for them like former homeschoolers, or they've met them through other um, activities or things like that? They're both. Yeah, yeah they're both of those good. categories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's most of the reason my kids are in school this year is because we too didn't have a community of people who are like minded. And what we, or we did, but again, my kids are like the last one standing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> um, my oldest has always felt like the oldest kid at the homeschool co-op thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so that was, they want, they want to be with community. And especially after a tough year of being isolated, they just, totally that felt like the option for them. And yeah. I understand it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And my son, my son always felt like school would be way too much. It would be too distracting yeah. and he couldn't focus on the things he really wanted mm-hmm. to learn. Mm-hmm. And yeah. as an introvert, he thrived that way. Totally. He had just enough social engagements throughout the week until right. COVID. Until COVID. Um, yeah. My daughter as a, as an extrovert or an ambivert, depending on the week, um, it's a little trickier for her, but she still is holding fast to not wanting to go. And I mm-hmm. said, mm-hmm. I said, your brother's decisions don't also need to be your decisions. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you're feeling called to school, don't feel like his story about why he didn't want to go applies right. to you because right. that's not necessarily true. Um, so, yeah. So, so personal. Yes, that's, that's it really is. And that's a that's a learning experience in and of itself is making those decisions for sure. Yeah. So, so you're kind of nearing the end of your homeschool career. I mean, I know you you still have one teenager at home, but what advice would you give parents who are just starting out? Um, Or what would you tell your younger self? For me, like so much of parenting, it comes down to trust Mm -hmm. and to joy um, I think it's so easy to get caught up in our heads about what we should be doing or what our neighbor is, you know, quizzing our kid on while he's trying Ugh. to just bring the mail in from the mailbox. <laughs> and and the truth is none of that actually is relevant. Mm-hmm. And what's relevant is the relationship that you get this amazing gift of building this relationship that's an all day, every day 
connection with your kid. Like how fantastic is that? And so to trust that, that that's totally natural. Um, this is how we evolve to, to engage with our kids and that they're going to learn exactly what they need to learn to thrive just by living their life. Totally. Yeah. That's that so is, true. It it's is. all about trust. <laughs> it really is. Trust, mm -hmm. trust in yourself, trust in your children, trust in the, the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that it doesn't need to be constant struggle. We don't need yes. to be fighting about worksheets and we don't need to be fighting about, you know, copy work. It can be as simple as let's, when my kids were younger, we would go to the woods one day a week and mm. we'd have a campfire and we would just be in the woods. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked me once, I had written a blog post about Woods Wednesday or something. Mm -hmm. And and someone commented, well, how do you have time for Shakespeare if <laughs> you're in the woods? And I said, we don't. But if my kids were super into Shakespeare, <laughs> we, we would. We'd make we'd time to figure it out. Woods. Yeah. yeah. There we're are other. The yeah. That's what we're doing. Right. <laughs> that is great. Uh, well, we've loved this conversation, yeah. Rachel, and Aww. we would love, you have so many things. You have uh, this great business, Lusa Organics, that I get all my soap from. You have these great books you've written. I would love if you could tell everybody where they can find you and about your books and your business um, so that they can make sure to connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. So there are a couple, I'll give you a couple of different websites. My my business website is Lusa Organics, L-U-S-A. That's named for Lupin and Sage, my two kids. Uh, so LusaOrganics.com is my business website. Both of my books are available on there. And then I do have a blog um, that is Rachel Wolf Clean, mm -hmm. clean like soap, uh, mm -hmm. dot com. And you can see the books on there and read about them and other fun things I'm brewing at the moment. I'm doing an adult and teen herbal retreat to Ireland coming up. So there's fun stuff that you can yeah. read about on, on the blog. Yes. Um, and then you, you can find you. You're on Instagram, too. I am. Yeah. I'm Lusa Mama and Lusa yes. Organics mm -hmm. on yeah. Instagram. Okay. And then there, if you search Lusa Organics, you'll find me on Facebook as well. Okay. Awesome. Great. Well, we are so th thankful that you uh, joined us today. I think that when we first started this podcast five years ago, you were on our dream list of people to have on. So <laughs> we're so, so excited to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for reaching out. I'm really glad you asked. All right. And if you would like to hear more from Rachel, Go over to patreon.com slash homeschool and refined. Join us there for an extended interview. We have another great conversation. It's a lot more relaxed and um, we just have so much fun talking with our guests over there. So enjoy that. All right, let's move on to loving this week. Yes, LTW. Yes, Angela, how about you? What are you loving this week? Okay, um, it was hard for me to pick. I had a few of them. This okay. week on my mind, but yeah. I, I chose one, knowing that we have a whole episode in Patreon dedicated to our LTWs. So <laughs> I have other places to talk about all the things I'm loving. That's great. But this one I picked was a book, The Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris. Okay. Okay. This, I heard about it from Oprah. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> this was Oprah's book club pick. I don't know when. So we know we're going to like it. Okay. Well, yep. I don't know. <clears throat> I've not always read Oprah's oh, okay. book club picks. Okay. Um, but for some reason, this one caught my eye. And I don't know when, she, I can't remember when it was her pick, like a few months ago. And I just put it on my list. And then what I do is I um, order it from the library. And then whenever it comes sure. in is when I start reading it. Great. It was also on um, Obama's summer re oh, wow. reading list. Well, so then. I was like, this is going to okay. be probably good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this is set just after the Civil War in a small Georgia town called Old Ox. And it is about two formerly ens enslaved brothers okay. and their relationship with this white couple who hires them to work on their farm okay. after their son has died in the war, fighting in the war. Wow. So it is a, first of all, super well-written novel. Also, like, uh, the characters mm -hmm. come to life. It okay. is ultimately about love relationships humanity 
and but amid kind of these awful circumstances right. of the reconstruction. Right. Um, it takes many turns. It's like, um, wow. it is, okay, the plot is amazing because it takes so many turns. So you're just like always wondering what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. But also, um, we spend a lot of time with the characters uh, in their development. So wow. for me, it was just this perfect blend of the kind of book that I really like to read. That sounds like a win-win, win-win, all the way around. Win-win, win-win. That is so yep. great. And then those ringing ador- endorsements from, oh, for from sure. all those people. So that's just And I don't know amazing. that I've ever read a book that's set at, right after the Civil War. Oh, yeah. Right. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, and just like this small town is dealing with, you know, yep. all the enslaved people are yep. now free. Yep. And what does that mean for the town and the economy and our relationship with them and everything? I want so more it was. Of that. Oh, yeah, it was a really great, great um, look into that time for me. Oh, so. This sounds great. I've been kind of on a little bit of a book hiatus, honestly. Oh, yeah, a slump. <clears throat> a slump. Like, I'm just not I'm not ready to move on. You know, this happens to me after I read yeah. a really good book. I'm not ready. Yeah. So, yeah. but maybe I feel like, and then I nothing's good enough. So maybe this is the one for me. Thank you. Yeah, and I I read it with my eyes, but I was thinking mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. this might be a good audiobook. Okay. I haven't listened to the you know a sample of it, but I feel like it would be one that might draw mm-hmm. you in. You know, sometimes I have a hard time with fiction on audio, but I feel like this could draw mm-hmm. me in. Okay, so great. All right, Myron, how about you? What are you loving this week? Okay, I'm loving actually two hair products, which is okay. this is really unlike me because I do not use hair products really. I don't <laughs> do a lot with my hair at all. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like, okay, so you know, you know, I have like just very fine, thin hair. It sticks straight and it's like any, usually any product weighs it down. Like any, yeah. even just like a dollop of something, mousse, uh, you know, yeah. anything <laughs> will just like weigh it down and it just like completely gets flat. So I have to pick and choose very, very carefully. Um, but I came to a point of desperation and just looked at Target of all places for these unicorn products and i think i think i found something good here and it's a mixture of these two things um one is it's actually kristen ne- sorry kristen s e s s yes i've heard of that have you dame yep. oh, okay yeah so it's called um air dry cream oh okay. and it's it also says weightless shine on it, mm. which those are words that really that hit, caught your eye. That caught my weightless <laughs> shine. Um, so an air dry cream. So this mm. you just put um, it's you just put like a dime size at mm-hmm. most maybe in your hand. Um, rub it into your hair after what you do is actually it's after when you get out of the shower or wash your hair. You actually it says half dry your hair. You know, like mm. just air dry your hair a little bit, which is good for me. I like to air dry my hair yeah. um and this doesn't take long for me <laughs> yeah. i mean i just yeah. all i have to do is put the towel on my head yeah and it's like half dry so yeah this is like i step out of the shower in a, a few minutes i put this on um and then it just says then just let your hair dry naturally if you or you can blow dry it if you want so um which is i also per- thank you <laughs> <laughs> for you know not having to do any work yeah, at all right. besides put this little thing on my in my hair and it says you know you can wait until your hair gets that natural kind of you know once you get out of the shower sometimes your hair is just still really wet but once it gets to that point where it's half dry yeah. where it's like there's a little bit of wave where it's kind of coming in yeah. it, into its own shape that's when you start putting it on so okay anyway and then you let it air dry or blow dry and then i also at the same time though when my hair is like half dry i get this other product so i put the air dry cream on then i got this other product and it's by pacifica and it's it's called salty waves texture spray Mm. um and it is it really does feel like you spent the day at the ocean and Mm. you know how I don't know <laughs> if you've ever spent spent time at the ocean, your hair gets a little salty and it gets a little windblown and it just mm-hmm. feels like you have this natural lift and texture in your hair. That's what this stuff does. And it's not, okay. it's, let's say, let's be real. It's not the same as like going to the ocean all day. 
and getting it for real. But it is really nice. It just gives it a, my hair a little lift with the lightest, uh, you know, amount of stuff that I could put in my hair. And right. it also just feels and it. <laughs> It is salty. Like if I if you get your hair in your mouth, you f- you taste that salt. Interesting. Yeah, I so know. Is there salt in it? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I believe so. Yeah. Well, it must be if it tastes like it. It definitely tastes like it. Yep. So. <laughs> All right. Yep. I love that. Yeah. I love that for you that you're finding a few products that work for you. I know. Because I know that's a lifelong struggle. (laughs) It's been a lifelong struggle. And most of the time I just don't. I can't find anything. So. Yeah. This is great. It it makes me feel good um, to have something. Yes. I bet. (laughs) To have something. So. Well, everybody, thank you for being here today. If you would like to follow us on social media, we are on Facebook and Instagram at Homeschool Unrefined. We also have a website, homeschoolunrefined.com, where you can find show notes and links to everything that we talked about. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Homeschool Unrefined is created and produced by Marin Gorse and Angela Sizer. Amanda Ginn is our content and marketing strategist. This podcast is listener supported. Join our growing community at patreon.com slash homeschool unrefined. We donate 10% of all Patreon income and product sales to The Conscious Kid, a black and brown led organization that has been instrumental in our own evolution and in leading the way in both ideological and tangible change with their work in parenting and education through a critical race lens. No matter how you homeschool, you are exactly who your kids need. You're doing great.